Good morning, everybody. Uh, Michael Coburn here from Guardian Wealth. You're very uh, welcome to this morning's webinar on what is a uh, kind of a wintry and wet September morning down here in Wexford. Um, uh, this webinar um, shouldn't take more than about 45 minutes. Um, that's the uh, that's the plan of attack here this morning. Um, so thank you very much for tuning in. Just a quick note uh, before we start. You will see on your screen there that the webinar was um, was supposed to be hosted by myself and Jim Doyle. Um, Jim unfortunately got called out to a meeting earlier this morning, um, just an urgent meeting. Um, so um, he won't be joining us. So I'm afraid you're stuck with me for the next uh, four to five minutes on what is um, our attempt, at least in our endeavor to explain pensions to you, um, particularly uh, pensions for solicitors. So the agenda today, um, we're going to have a look at and explain the whole area of tax relief on pension payments. Excuse me, tax relief and pension payments. I know it's, a, it's, a, it's an area for some of you, not all of you, but for some of you that uh, causes a little bit of confusion, I think, especially this time of year when, you're, when you get that dreaded call from your accountant um, um, uh, kind of outlining uh, what, the, what the damage is from tax perspective and what you can do maybe to alleviate some of that damage. We also want to give you an overview of financial markets and pension funds and um, just take a quick look maybe at what's been going on in financial markets and, and pension funds over the last number of months, um, especially with, again, some of the damage wrought by uh, the recent coronavirus. Um, and I'll, I'm kind of leading on from that, looking at the importance of pension fund growth to your pension and some of the best and the worst performers um, in terms of fund managers. And then, I suppose, lastly, we'll, we'll look at the whole area of uh, what happens when you draw down your pension and when it comes to, for any of you, I suppose, who are at that or getting close to that point in time, when it comes to looking at tax-free lump sums from pensions, um, approved retirement funds, annuities, etc. So really what, what, we've, what we've put together here is a, a kind of a cradle-to-grave uh, look at pensions in terms of why put, why put money into pensions, how does tax relief work, what is it that you, you need to achieve in, uh, kind of once your money is invested in your pension over 20, 30, 40, 50 odd years. And then also what happens when you go to access your pension? What are the rules around that? And what does that look like? So hopefully it'll give you, it'll give you a better understanding of what it is you're actually doing. And we've a little offer um, for, um, uh, for you all then at the end of the presentation. If we have time for Q&A, certainly I'll, I'll delve into any questions you have and feel free to send them in. Um, if I don't get to all the questions, um, I'll collate them all up and I will pop everybody an email uh, just with the replies to all of the questions uh, maybe later on today or early uh, early tomorrow morning so um, we've a bit to get through so we're, we're going to crack on here and um, just a note the this is the first of our three webinars in our autumn winter series um, number two will be sometime in october um, and we'll uh, we'll probably look at the whole area of uh, pensions pension funds different types of pensions and the inheritance tax treatment and um, so uh, you know kind of what happens to pension funds in the event of uh, somebody passing away which obviously is applicable for yourselves but also um, for your clients um, especially in the whole area of inheritance tax planning and um, so that that uh, should be a benefit um, to you to to everybody really um, and a very quick note um, just for I, I, I can see our attendee list here this morning and um, some names I recognize and some names I, I don't um, we're Guardian Wealth, founded in 2005. Um, we used to operate under the brand of RDA Accountants, which some of you might remember us from um, if we haven't spoken to in the last couple of years. And we rebranded re and split the business back about uh, two, two and a half years ago at this stage. Um, and so Guardian Wealth is the brand and the, the name that we operate under now, but we have been around since about 2005. And the business is run by um, Jim Doyle and myself. And obviously we're pension and financial planning advisors for business owners and at the moment we'd have about 100 million uh, of uh, funds that we advise on for our clients um, and I'm down here in our Wexford office here at the moment uh, with a small office up there in Dublin as well. So tax relief, how does it work? Um, so again some of you will be aware of this and some won't so I'm, I'm going to assume that, that, that nobody knows anything and we'll, we'll, we'll take it from there. So um, there are obviously there are very generous tax reliefs and incentives available for people to put money in, into their pensions. Um, and in terms of personal pensions for solicitors who are self-employed, um, and this actually also applies, applies to employees as well, based on your age, you are entitled to put a greater and greater 
portion of your income into your pension fund and claim tax relief. So that's kind of the first point to note. One of, one of the advantages to getting older is that you're allowed to put more and more money into your pension fund and get tax relief on it. So what you can see there is, uh, for example, on that table is for uh, somebody who's under 30 years of age, uh, that person could put 15% of their income, of their assessable income into a pension fund and claim tax relief on, on, that, on that contribution at their marginal uh, uh, tax rate, which for, for most people would be at the 40%. And as you get older, so looking at that table there, um, so from age 60 or over, um, you know, you can put up to 40% of your assessable income into a pension fund and claim tax relief at your marginal rate, uh, which would be the higher rate of tax. And we, we actually have a work example here on this now in a second. One thing to note that the, the ability to claim tax relief is capped at 115,000. So for example, taking that, that example of somebody who's age 60, if they, if they, had, uh, they were making a pension contribution, let's say they had assessable income of 200,000, well, they can't actually put 40% of 200,000 into their pension fund. Um, they could only put maximum 40% of the 115,000 cap into their pension fund. But we actually have a work example here, um, just to make this a little bit more, a little bit more real for you. Um, but the basic point is, as you get older, you can put more and more and more money into your pension fund. So this is the example uh, for tax relief. I'm just going to minimize the screen here for one second so I can see it myself. Apologies. So this is an example of tax relief. A um, bit of a busy slide here, but I, I will endeavor to explain it as best I can. Um, and just looking at why, why, I suppose, the tax relief on pensions, leaving aside any other consideration with regards to pensions, but purely from a tax relief point of view, um, why, why it actually makes sense and why, and why you're, 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 you probably have been doing it over the years. Um, so we have on the left-hand side of the screen here, this is an example of somebody, um, uh, actually a, a gentleman called Paul, who's single um, on 100,000, or has 100,000 euro of assessable income. Um, and he had that in 2019. So now in 2020, he's, he's solving, he's figuring out his 2019 tax liability. And we're gonna say for the sake of, of argument that he, um, he has, he's going to have the same income in, in 2020. So I've done a little bit of a calculation to say, well, Paul, uh, based on um, a couple of factors, he has a tax bill of about 38,500 euro for 2019. And this has been kind of his tax return is being done now in 2020 for, for 2019. Now, of that 38,500 euro tax bill, he has already paid 90% uh, of it when he paid his preliminary tax last year anyway. So of the 38,500, he's already paid about 34,500, okay? Um, he is not making a pension payment, okay? So he's no tax relief to offset against anything here. So now in 2020, as part of his income tax return, he also has to make his prelim payment for 2020. And your prelim is 90% of the, of the previous year. So the previous year being 38,500, 90% of that is 34,660. So we add up the 2019 tax bill, less than he's already paid, plus his prelim for, uh, for 2020, that comes to 38,500 euros. So he's going to be getting a tap on the shoulder from his accountant to say, look, um, uh, 38,500 euros has to be paid across to revenue. And um, rightly, Paul will you know, put his hand up and go, well, look, is there any way of bringing that tax bill down? And that's, that's where the tax relief on, on pensions actually st starts to come in. So the same example here, but here we're going to look at uh, um, Paul is making a 25,000 euro um, uh, pension payment. So his tax bill is still 38,500 euro from last year. And let's, let's assume that this is the first year he's making a pension payment. He's already paid 34,660, which is the prelim he paid last year. Now, because he's making a, a, a 25,000 euro pension payment, which is the most he can make based on his age from the previous previous uh, slide. So he's making a 25,000 euro pension payment and he's going to be able to claim tax relief at his marginal rate of income tax, which is 40%. He's going to be able to claim tax relief of 40% on the 25,000, which is tax relief of minus 10, or sorry, tax relief of, of 10,000. So now also he's doing his tax return, so he has to pay his prelim for 2020. Now his prelim for 2020 is going to be a lower figure than the left-hand side of the table, because we, we've, his prelim for 2020 is based on his 2019 tax, income tax liability, but we've brought down his 2019 income tax liability because of the pension payment we've actually made to retrospectively take care of, of 2019. So his prelim, instead of being 34, 
his prelim is 25. So it's almost like a double whammy. We're getting the benefit of bringing down his tax bill for 2019, but we're also getting the benefit from a cash flow point of view of bringing down his, his prelim for 2020. So his total payment to revenue there now is about 19 and a half thousand. So it was 38, now it's 19 and a half. So, you know, in one sense, that's part of the puzzle completed in that, well, who wouldn't want to pay less tax? Um, from a cash flow point of view, it needs to be understood too, though, that he's, he's making a pension, uh, a payment to revenue of 19 and a half, because we've brought down his tax bill. He still has to find 25,000 to actually make the pension payment. So really what we're saying is, if we add up the, the tax bill plus the pension payment, his, his, his net cash outflow is 44,500. So that's the payment revenue plus the payment in, into the pension. So really what we're saying here is, from a cash flow point of view, it's costing him 40, 44,500 euro, which is a combination of revenue payment and um, payment into the pension, as opposed to 30, 38 and a half, but the 38 and a half was all going to revenue. So really, it's the difference between these two figures is about 6,000 euro. So what we're saying is it's costing him 6,000 euro um, to get 25,000 euro into his pension. So that's the real benefit, um, I suppose, of or the immediate, the immediate kind of benefit of, of paying money into pensions um, when it comes to trying to figure out and bring down tax liability. It's a, it's a little bit of an additional cash flow uh, required, but from a tax point of view, it makes it makes absolute sense. So that's kind of what your accountant is doing at the moment and trying trying to figure out. Um, and that, you know, as your income changes, these figures are going to change. But really, it's it's offsetting the liability from last year and trying to bring your prelim down for 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 this year um subject to having the cash flow to actually achieve that so in that sense it's a bit of a no-brainer but i suppose as we all know um anybody who's had a pension over the years you know if if, if it were that simple um you know we wouldn't have these questions really looking at tax relief is kind of the start of the pension journey what we have to do is to look at well what happens to your money and what happens to my money once I've done this and I have money kind of resting in pensions for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and then what happens when I take the when I take the money out of the pension? So we kind of have to follow follow the cash and follow the journey to really understand how how all of this works. And this is just step one in the process, but hopefully it'll it'll make sense for you. So um, you've written the check um, um, and you have money in your pension fund. Uh, great. Now. What can your pension fund invest it in? And all of you will have your money invested in something inside inside in the pension fund. Um, your pension fund can pretty much invest in anything that you could think of. Um, so any, anything that you could invest in personally, privately, is what your pension can can actually invest in as well. There is no, there are a couple of limits, but but there aren't many. But in broad strokes, what I have here is it's it really it's it's a it's a it's it's a a, a toss up between I want to make as much money as I possibly can, but I want as smooth a possible journey on the way. Um, and ideally, I don't want my pension fund to be behaving like a roller coaster that it's up and down like a yo-yo. So what your pension can invest in um, on the on the very low end of the of the risk scale, um, which is our a little blue circle here in the bottom left, that's our pension fund that's all invested in cash. So it's very low risk. But it's very low, low return. Now, the little arrow there, um, it's actually a negative return. So monies that are in, that are sitting in a pension, if, if you have a pension fund or you know anybody who has a pension fund, after money is sitting in, in a cash fund in their pension fund, it's actually falling in value because the return on cash now for monies held in pension for the most part is actually negative. It's a negative interest rate. And then you have management fees uh, on top of that, and you have inflation is eating into it as well. So having money in cash in a pension fund. To my mind, there's 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 arguably hardly ever, if ever, a case for having money sitting in cash. You might have a small amount, maybe, but but having it all in cash doesn't doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So if we're if we're if we're saying okay, well that doesn't make sense. Well, what's the next step up on the risk ladder in terms of taking a little bit more risk to try and generate some kind of return? Well, what we're up to then are fixed interest funds, or uh, um, essentially they're government and corporate bonds. So that that is. Um, in its truest sense is you or your pension fund is actually lending money, for example, to the German government. And in return, um, you're, 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 you're investing in bonds. So in return, the German government historically, or the Irish government or the UK government, or whatever, whatever it might be, they are committing to give a fixed rate of payment or fixed interest payment on that money over a period of time, and then, and then a repayment of the initial capital at a point in the future. 
in the past that actually worked. But now, because things are gone a little bit haywire, um, and because the European Central Bank is printing so much money and central banks around the world, um, if you were if you were investing in in a, in a for example a German government bond inside in, a, in your in your in your pension fund, your pension fund would actually have to pay the German government. It's a negative rate to hold your money. So you know, I'm, I'm giving the German government, I'm picking on Germany, but I'm giving the German government money. Um, and then they're going to give me back, they're telling me now they're going to give me back less in 20 or 30 years time. So um, historically using bonds has worked for the kind of the lower risk, lower return approach, but it, you know that's kind of falling apart um, arguably a little bit at the moment as well. So by default to make money, you're kind of pushed up the risk spectrum. So we're into property, we're into shares, we're into um, alternative investments, which we can make, you know, maybe gold, uh, commodities, uh, oil, et cetera, et cetera. That, so that is really, the only place where there is where there is any hope of making uh, of making return on on investment at the moment, but it's not without its risks. And I'm just going to focus on the stock market here for a moment because, to a greater or lesser extent, anybody who has a pension fund would have a you know exposure to the stock market. Depending on the fund you're in, it might be 20 or 30 percent exposure to the stock market. And um, if you're in a higher risk fund, you know it could be it could be 80, 90, 100 percent. So. Um, a great quote there, some of, you, some of you might recognize this gentleman, his name is Warren Buffett, um, otherwise known as the Sage of Omaha, arguably uh, regarded as one of the, the, the canniest investors of all time. Um, and you know, he's, he's, a lot of, he's a lot of kind of great one-liners, but the one I like the most is, is this one here, the stock market is a device for transferring money from the impatient to the patient. Um, and I have a chart here, just which explains this because in the background again, you know, this is what is driving a lot of, of the activity in your, your pension fund. So this is the US stock market, a very busy slide, but this is the US stock market. And this is um, down the bottom left-hand side of the screen is 10,000 euro or thereabouts invested in 1982. Um, and then this, you know, this is up until, this is about two months old, but it hasn't changed a whole lot in the last couple of months. Um, so really, it's showing that somebody invested the bonds of 10,000 euro in 1982 in the US stock market, and probably now that 10,000 euro was worth, you know, give or take, maybe 160, 165,000 euro. So, you know, yeah, and the premise here is, you know, pensions are, are, are a long-term investment asset. So, you know, you can afford to take a long-term view for the most part when it comes to investing in, in pensions. And we're looking at here over this considerable time period, well, who wouldn't like to turn 10,000 euro into 165,000 euro? But it's not a, it's not a linear, it's not a linear um, approach, um, you know, where it's a constant climb with no falls. So to, to get that return on investment, um, there is pain that has to be endured along the way. And this thing is like a roller coaster. So it's up and down and up and down and up and down like a yo-yo. And if I just bring you back to a look at recent events in a second, but if I bring you back to, let's say 2008, 2009 into 2010, which is the last big financial uh, um, crisis and stock markets fell by the bones of 50 odd percent. And I remember at the time because, um, you know, I, I, would, I, was, I, was, I was a lot younger than I am now, but I was still doing what I'm doing. And I remember at the time, you know, there were people kind of saying, well, you know, it's the end of the stock market, the end, end of this, and it's, the end of capitalism and uh, we'll never, it'll, it'll take a generation for the stock market to recover. It recovered in the space of two and a half or three years. It's not to say it wasn't pretty, it was horrendous, but again, it just, it just goes, I suppose, to illustrate the point that over time, these things recover. And the basic premise behind all of this is it's, it, there are far, far, far more good years than bad years, but the bad years typically happen about once every 10 years. And that's just, it's the nature of the beast, unfortunately, and trying to time, you know, completely time at least, you know, the, the rises and, and the crashes. Um, um, you and I, and I feel myself in this, are as likely to get that wrong as get it right, because it's just not possible to predict, um, as we have seen with uh, recent events, who would have thought we would be where, where we actually are. Um, so it's, 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 it's just, I suppose, it's, it's the price that has to be endured to get long, long-term growth. And um, a question I get asked a lot at the moment, you know, you know, pension funds, uh, investment funds, the stock market, what's coming, what's the next 12 months look like? You know, arguably, it doesn't look pretty. Um, 
you know, we have coronavirus out there, we have Brexit, we have US elections, we have a trade war between China and, um, and the US. We have that prickly cheery looking gentleman down in the bottom left hand corner, which is there to represent an empty office. What does it mean for, for the property market um, if we're all um, so fond of now working from home? Is this a permanent fixture? Um, what does that mean for commercial and office space? What does it mean for, for the high street? There are challenges there. So there are a lot of headwinds uh, to be faced, um, and then up the top right-hand corner, um, you know, at least I think that's Gorgie's pub in Dublin. So the pubs are inter inter intermittently open and closed. So we can't even drown our sorrows here at the moment. Um, so it's there. There is a lot to be fearful of. But if I had to have a slide three years ago, it would have been kind of the same, uh, the same idea in that what we were, what the headwinds were likely to be were different. But there are always headwinds of some description. And if we, if I looked at this in Five years time, it'll be a it'll be a different set of circumstances or, or problem. And five years after that, it'll be something different. So the the pattern repeats itself, arguably, but it's just it's just the the nature of the trouble tends to change over time. So we're into the realm of pension funds and pension fund providers, who essentially are all looking at the same data and trying to interpret what's likely to happen next. And you know, the pension companies that you are more than likely aware of you 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 might have your pension fund invested um, with some of these some of these players um, you know you have Irish Life, New Ireland, Zurich, Friends First, Aviva and so on and so on, you know, Bank of Ireland AIB. Um, and the performance of these funds uh, with these companies and fund managers, um, if they're you know the argument would be well if they're all looking at the same set of data, should the results of these pension funds not all be the same? Because um, looking at the same thing, they all have 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 um, they all have access to the same information. So they're all kind of reading the tea leaves, trying to figure out, well, what's likely to happen next? Um, but there are, there are big differences between pension companies and funds. And I'm just going to show you that now in a second, um, just to give you an idea of maybe of, of what, what you might have a reasonable expectation of in terms of pension fund growth and what's possible out there. And really, look, it's, it's our job as advisors is to kind of hold these pension companies to account um, and get an insight into what it is they're doing why they're doing what they're doing, what their, their approach is, what their, what their view of the world is, um, to see how much sense, good, bad, or indifferent it actually makes. Um, so we can, we can advise our clients as best we possibly can. So to put that into perspective, I, I'm, I'm bringing this back down to just for a second for the last year, because the last year it was the implosion of stock markets due to the coronavirus. So what you're looking here on the, uh, on the slide in front of you is uh, the end of September of 2019 up until the end of September or 29th of September yesterday. And these are two um, similar funds in that they're, they, are, they would be considered the same risk profile funds. So um, just to take a step back for a second, all pension funds across the Irish market, there's a standardized risk rating scale. It works on a, on a one to seven scale. So kind of a pension fund with a risk rating of one, if you looked under the hood of it, would be pretty much all cash. Pension fund with a risk rating of seven, if you looked under the hood of it, would be pretty much 100% in equities, 100% in the in the stock market. So I've taken a risk profile four fund here, um, which is kind of a middle of the range, um, leaning on 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 um, let's say more in, into the in, into the stock market. And um, so I've compared two funds of a similar risk rating. So we're comparing like with like, and it's actually two funds from the same company. Um, they're just run by different fund managers, but they're they're actually two funds from the same from the same company. Um, and in this case, they're actually two um, two Irish Life funds. Um, so you would expect, look, two Irish Life funds, same company, um, looking at the same set of data. Sure, you know, invested in pretty much the same thing. Sure, or at least the ability to invest in the same thing. They should be behaving pretty much the same way. But over the la over a twelve month period, one of them was up eleven eleven and a half percent, and the other one was down about two and a half percent. So Obviously, the red line, which is the good performer, you know, um, the, the underlying assets and the decision making process from, from whomever the fund manager is, is an awful lot better than the, um, than the decision making process and the fund management of the fund, which is represented by the yellow line. Now, one thing to state, this right here in the middle is the, is the coronavirus. So, you know, when the coronavirus hit, stock markets plummeted to the quickest fall of all time. Stock markets generally were down about 33% in the space of less than a month. 
um, or these funds didn't fall as heavily as that because they 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 weren't they weren't they weren't uh, fully invested in the stock market. They had other bits and pieces in there too. Um, but nevertheless, they both fell. But really, there were there were contrasting decisions made here at this point, where one fund manager kind of looked at the tea leaves essentially and said, "I think this is a short-lived fall. I think markets are going to rally quite quickly," which is what happened. The other fund manager thought. Do you know what? Um, I don't like the stock market. Maybe we'll pull back from this because we think there's more pain coming, and they got it wrong. So that, that, that's essentially what happened. So there are big differences between funds and fund managers. Having said that, um, I would never make any judgments on any fund or any, any pension fund over the course of a year because it can, it can, you know, the position can be reversed six six months later. So what I've done here in terms of looking at pension fund growth in terms of what, what you would like as investors and as pension investors, what you would like to achieve and what we would like to achieve for our clients is I've looked at a selection of companies and I've compared what are called managed funds, um, which would be on the kind of on the, on the five risk level on, the, on this uh, one to seven scale. So it'll be on kind of on the higher risk end of the scale. And I've looked at the best and worst performers over a five year stretch. So I've labeled these companies A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, um, chiefly because I don't, I don't want to get involved in a court case with some of these guys, but individually um, I can talk to you and let you know who this, these companies are. Um, but you can see here over, a, over five years, highlighted in yellow. Um, so over a five year stretch, um, the company E has an average return of 1.6% per annum, whereas company G, has an average return of 6.1, and we're comparing funds which are very similar. So we're not we're comparing apples and apples here. Now that's a that's about a 30% difference over five years. You know, it's a difference of four and a half percent a year over five years. It's about 30%. Um, that's a huge difference. So what I'm going to look at here is if if that was replicated over over a long period of time, what difference would that actually make? Is what what's the value of Making sure that your money is at least in the with the, with the you know the top one or two companies and the top one or two fund performers, rather than letting it stagnate um, through through um, through inertia or for whatever reason, um, just ticking over and eking out a very small small return. So going back to the example here of Paul, I'm, I'm picking on Paul uh, throughout our our presentation here. So Paul is, uh, as we know, a solicitor age 45. This is the, the, Paul is the gentleman who we, we explained how tax relief worked earlier on in the presentation. So Paul is 45, wants to retire at 60. Um, he sees himself taking it easy from 60. He doesn't want to keep slogging away any time past 60. He's going to continue making his 25,000 euro pension payment um, for the next 15 years. So what I've looked at here is if on average, excuse me, Paul was getting, you know, his he was with the, the top performing fund manager based on our previous example and he was getting an average of about six percent a year his pension fund would grow to about six hundred and twenty two thousand if he stayed with the the worst performing pension fund for those 15 years but putting in the same amount of money so he's getting 1.6 percent of a return his pension fund would be 426 uh for nearly 427 thousand that's a difference of about 195,000. So that's a huge difference. He's not, he's not working longer. He's not putting any more money in. Um, he's just making sure that he's with one of the better performing fund managers and providers. So those one, two, three, four uh, percent uh, uh, differences over the long term can make a massive difference um, to the final value of your, your pension fund. That's not to say you'd be cha you know, you're chopping and changing all the time, but certainly there is merit in every four or five years of just looking at the at the performance of your own pension fund and saying, okay, um, you know, this is what I got. What, you know, what other manager fund fund um, pension fund companies are out there um, could I have done any better? And maybe making it making a, a judgment at that point in time. And um, so you're making the most of what is your hard earned money. Um, you might get sore eyes looking at this. Uh, I will explain it as best I can. So really what we're saying is some fund managers do better than others. Um, and this is just a, a kind of a, 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 a graphical representation of that in action, um, kind of in real time as, as things change. So this is a fund operated by one of the pension companies. I think it's Zurich, as far as I remember. Um, and in this Zurich fund, this goes, if we look at it back in February, 2015, um, this blue, blue bar here, 
this is the stock market okay um, and the exposure this fund has to the stock market and then we have some some of our bonds and then we have a little bit of property and then we have some gold and bits and pieces and then we have cash so you can see that this is changing over time this is all the way up until i think it's like the uh today actually i think this is an older chart it was with the end of uh, i think the end of all the start of september so i suppose what you can see here is at various points along the way um they increased their exposure to the stock market for their investors. And then when they didn't like what they were seeing and what they thought was going to happen, um, they were reducing their exposure to, to the stock market. And I suppose that's the most interesting, um, at least I find it interesting, um, at least, is they, they um, probably in December and January, they reduced their exposure to the stock market because they were a bit, essentially a little bit windy about what was going to happen coronavirus-wise. The, the, and then kind of coming into the latter half of March into April, May, June, they, they increased their exposure to the stock market because they thought, they thought the stock market was going to rebound. But um, this was most interestingly, they, um, they, in recent months, they've, they've started to reduce their exposure to the stock market again because they, they, they are arguably think based on this that the, there is another, another fall in markets is going to happen. Now, this actually takes us up until I think it's the end of August, start of September. It turns out they were right because um, the stock market has been selling off uh, over the last four or five weeks in September. So kind of consistently making correct decisions um, over a long period of time. And that's kind of what's hap what should happen under the hood of, of pension funds is that there are decisions being, being, being made um, to try and pr protect you where possible, but maximize the value of, of, your, of your, your investment in the background. So we've kind of gotten to the point of we've looked at the tax relief, hopefully a general understanding of the principle behind that. We've looked at the importance of getting fund growth and you know um, and the importance of, of of making sure that your fund that you're squeezing every penny out of it out of your pension that you possibly can. And then we've the issue of great. Well, let's say we've we've kind of we've done all the right things. We're going to access the pension. Which I know some of you, you know, if you're kind of late fifties heading towards sixty um, and more. That you're, you know, okay, I'm thinking about accessing my pension. How does all this work? So I want to give you an overview of, I suppose, some of the technicality and the important points when it when it comes to looking at this. So I've kept the example of Paul, and Paul now has a 622,000 euro pension fund based on all the work that has been done over the years. So Paul is 60. He's not going to retire necessarily, but he's hit 60, and at 60 you can access all of your pension funds, or if you have multiple pension funds, you can access maybe one or two of them if needs be, um, which a lot of people do, you know, maybe you get, kind of get to 60, there's a bit of mortgage debt maybe lying around, you're not planning on retiring, retiring, but maybe you might be winding down a little bit, you know, you might, but you want to clear off some debt in advance of, of that kind of a tran transition. So Paul here has decided he's 60, he wants to access his pension fund. So 622,000. So the rules as laid out by revenue are as follows. He's entitled to a quarter of his pension fund as, as a lump sum, which is 155,529. That lump sum is capped at 200,000, by the way. But he's entitled to a quarter of his pension fund as a lump sum, which is about 155,000 to be used however he sees fit. Um, that's pretty simple. Then he, of the balance, then he has 466,588. And that's the piece that he has a bit of a decision to, to actually make. And, Basically, the options there are he can use the 466,000 to purchase an annuity, which is a payment for life. Um, so essentially, he's giving the insurance company 466,000 euro, and in return, they are going to give him a fixed income for the rest of his days. Now, I wouldn't recommend annuities for 99% of people. The rationale being as well, he's, he would be giving up ownership of his 466,000. Okay, if he lives to if he lives to be a very ripe old age, it might be the right decision. But if something happens to Paul ten years uh, from age sixty, and you know he he's he's gotten whatever money he's gotten in terms of annual payments, but he certainly hasn't gotten four hundred sixty six thousand worth. Well, then if something happens to him, uh, the pension company are um, are thrilled if Paul passes away because they get to keep the balance. So um, it's not an attractive option for ninety nine percent of people, but it actually it actually is 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 an option. Um, so I suppose, but for for most people, it's it's the the approved retirement fund. So it's the ARF. So the approved retirement fund is essentially it's like a rollover pension fund, less the tax-free cash lump sum. So the approved retirement fund at this point stays invested in much the same way that you might invest a pension. 
excuse me, that you might invest a pension, but you're drawing income from it at the same time that you're trying to make the thing grow. So it's a bit like an elastic band. You're trying to stretch the life of it by making it grow, whilst at the other end, you're, you're taking some in income out of it. Um, so it's, it's, it's not a static fixed 466,000 that has to last Paul in this case for maybe, you know, for 30 years in retirement if he lives up until age 90. It's a kind of a, it's, a, it's almost a living, breathing fund all by itself with a lot of decisions to make um, the same kind of decisions that you would make with the pension fund. The big advantage there, of course, then is if something were to happen to Paul, so the same example that if he passed away maybe at age 70, um, whatever's in the approved retirement fund, whatever's still left in it, would actually form part of his estate. Um, so from an inheritance point of view, the approved retirement funds are, 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 a, are a real no-brainer. No so what I've looked at here is uh, another table, and hopefully you're still with me. Um, so I've kind of looked at to say, well, if Paul is 60 and he has an approved retirement fund valued at 466,000, what's, kind of, what's a sustainable level of income that he could take from that fund let's say between age 60 and 90, so that you know, by the time he hits 90, the thing is pretty much empty. And I've assumed a growth rate of about 5%. I know we were looking at kind of a higher growth rate um, on the pension calculations up until now, but maybe at this point in time, he's taking a little bit more risk. Um, so we'll, we'll dial it down a notch just to make it maybe a little bit more realistic. So he's getting, let's say, 5% growth on his approved retirement fund. So if you just follow the example here, he's 60. He's 466,000 in his approved retirement fund. Still has his tax-free lump sum in his back pocket um, to do with as he pleases. The fund grows to 490. He takes out 24,500, and then the you know uh, the fund falls to 466 because of the withdrawal amount. So in the following year, it's valued at 466. It grows again. He takes more money, and that cycle is repeated until just time as as it's actually empty. Now I've assumed the reason I've picked 24,300 here is, um, you know, I've picked a, a level of income that's sustainable to take so that it would last until age 90. And I've also assumed that he's taking out 2% more income each year, uh, roughly to keep pace with inflation. So we kind of roll this all the way to 89. And um, by 89, the value of it is down to about 8,500. But the income he has taken over the years, um, I've left out obviously a lot of roles here. I've just done, you know, age 60, 70, 80, and 90. But the income he has taken out of this over the years cumulatively is about 985,000. So even though he's only he's 466 in his retirement fund, because it's still invested and he's still getting investment growth, um, it's not like he only has 466,000 to last him for 30 years because he has investment growth on top of that, which cumulatively comes to about 985,000 euro. So to try and wrap all of this up kind of from cradle to grave to make a little bit of sense of this and um, this is kind of the journey that paul has been on so he's paid in twenty-five thousand per annum for 15 years into his pension which is about three hundred and seventy-five thousand euro that's what he's paid into his pension he's gotten tax relief at his margin rate of 40 percent so he's gotten tax relief of about one hundred and fifty thousand over those 15 years so the net cost to paul is about 225,000 euro. That's the, 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 the net pain um, he has experienced in terms of putting money into his pension fund. His pension fund then, the gross contributions of 375 over about 15 years have grown to 622 based on getting an average return of about 6% a year. Obviously, if we go for a slightly lower risk funds, we'll bring down the return, but for the purposes of this illustration, we'll, we'll stick with our six. So, you know, he's, he, has, he hasn't doubled his money, he's gone from 375 to 622, but, you know, he's probably up to the bones of 70 or 80% over 15 years, which, which is kind of roughly what you would expect over the long term. And of that 622, well, he's a lump sum of 155,000 that he will, he will take out his pension fund. And then, because the pension fund, the approved retirement fund, remains invested for 30 years after that, um, he, that he, gets, he gets the income from that plus he, his growth on that retirement fund as well. So it comes to about 990 odd thousand. So, and this may seem a little bit, a little bit of a kind of counterintuitive almost, but the net cost is 225, which is just a statement of fact to him. But what he's gotten out of it over his lifetime, all the way up to 90, is the lump sum plus the income. So it's about 1.11 million. So but really what I'm saying is if he can put up with the pain of um, over the years of his pension fund falling and rising in value, um, 
it certainly does make sense. Now, I haven't gone to the nth degree purely because of time to look at, you know, he will pay some income tax on the on the approved retirement fund income, um, but that's a function of a number, a number of, of items. But even if he pays some income tax on that, he's still well up in the long run. Um, um, so it, it kind of does make sense for him, uh, provided, you know, make, I suppose what I'm saying, it makes sense, provided you, he understands all the component parts of it and he's willing to accept um, some, of the, some of the turmoil along the way. Um, you know, safer approaches to put it into, into far safer funds and save, save himself a couple of sleepless nights. Um, um, and that, that is what a lot of people would, would do. Um, so it's, it really is horses for, for courses. But either way, even if you're in the kind of the lower risk end of things, it's still important to make sure that you're getting the best return on the lower risk pension fund that, that you might actually have. Um, a couple of very practical pitfalls to be aware of, um, just to give you some, some um, some uh, something practical to take away from this um, and just also the notes on this present of this webinar will be sent to you all individually as well as a bit of a reference um, I know I'm, I'm trying to cover a lot here in 45 minutes but um, um, so you can you can read down through it in, in your own time um, and we will have probably a recording of this as well so if um, if you really want you can listen to me a second time but I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend it um, so the pension pitfalls to be aware of um, Broadly speaking, pen, pensions with banks, fee structure generally is higher um, and customer service um, can be a bit limited with limited funds to choose from, hard to contact. So um, I think in general, pension investors probably get a better service from the, the broker market. Now, I would say that, wouldn't I? But um, um, especially at the moment, um, a, lot of, a lot of the advisors and banks physically aren't allowed to meet people. Um, um, so, um, and you know, most 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 smaller brokers around the country still still are meeting people. Allocation fees. This is a big one. If you took nothing else away, if you're about to write the check for your pension contribution, beware of allocation fees. Allocation fees are. I'll have a very quick worked example on this in a second. But allocation fees are, if you uh, let's say write a check. Take the example of Paul here. He writes a check for twenty five thousand into his pension fund. Um, what he wants is 100% allocation. And what that means is the full value of the 25,000 euro goes into the pension fund. Very simple. If he has an allocation fee of, let's say, 97%, what that means is 3% of his 25,000 goes in a fee, never makes it into the pension fund. And those kinds of fees can add up to substantial, a substantial amount of money over a period of time. And I'm going to show you that now in a second. Um, but it's something to be very aware of if you're writing the check. Uh, in the next couple of weeks into the pension fund it's the first question I, I, I would always ask if I were you you know some of this stuff is 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 kind of common sense you know I really should be sitting down um, every year um, or thereabouts with you whomever your pension advisor is and just you know get their read on what's happening why it's happening do we need to make changes as the pension company I'm with is it the strongest company I could be with etc etc um, and just to start looking at or even looking at alternative fund options that the pension company you're with might actually have as a as a simple fix. Um, the I suppose two big points at the moment we're seeing more of for any of you who have self-administered pensions. Um, if you don't know what a self-administered pension is, then you don't need to worry because you probably don't have one. But if if you do have a self-administered pension and if it's if you have a lot of money sitting in cash in your self-administered pension, the rate of return on cash is now negative for most self-administered pensions, meaning you're even though you're in cash, you're falling in value. Um, and if you're going to leave it in cash long term, there's no point in having a, a self-administered pension. It just defeats the purpose of the exercise. So you either need to make an investment decision with it and do something with it, or get rid of your self-administered pension structure and, and, and put it into, in inverted commas, a more normal standard pension structure to start driving some, some growth. We're seeing an awful lot of that at the moment, and um, people who self up, set up self-administered pensions maybe with a view to buy property or something, and it's sitting there years later um, and just going nowhere fast. Um, if, if anybody or anybody you know is working in the UK, um, there's a lot of activity at the moment in terms of people who have pensions in the UK because of Brexit, transferring them back to Ireland. Um, they just don't like what's happening in the UK. Um, they're uh, nervy about what way it's going, and they just want to get all of their assets out of the UK, the pension being one of them. and um, um, uh, it is possible for the most part to transfer your, if you have a UK pension, to transfer back to Ireland and have a bit more control of it over here. So um, those two seem to be uh, 
kind of uh, some dominant themes that we're, we're, we're facing as, a, uh, as advisors at the moment. This is a very quick example of the allocation uh, issue. I'm going to finish up now in a second. I see a couple of questions coming in, so I might try and get to one or two of them if I can. So again, this is Paul, uh, who's 45, retiring at age 60. Uh, we're picking on Paul again. He's putting in a 25,000 a year. He's going to put that in for the next 15 years. We're assuming for a second he's getting 6% growth on his pension fund. Okay. If he has 100% allocation on his pension contribution, so the full value was 25,000 every year for the next 15 years going into his pension fund, and he's getting a 6% growth rate, well then we know his fund is going to be 622 because we've looked at it. If he's getting 97% allocation, which means 3% of his money is going in a fee, you know, never makes it into the pension, and even if he's, but he's still getting the 6% growth rate on the money once it's in there, the pain on that means his pension fund is going to be about 603,500 euro in value at age 60. So that 3% allocation has cost him about 18,500 euro um, in unnecessary fees. There is no reason for it. Really, it's a fee that's going to an advisor or a broker or something, and there's just no point in paying it. It's, it's the, the direct, it's, it's, the, it's the very same as writing a check for 18,500 and handing it over to a bank or a broker or whomever. Um, 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 and they'll shake your hand and say thanks very much. Um, it never, it doesn't go into your pension fund. So, so before you write the check, just make sure you have 100% allocation, and there's nothing that's been taken off the top because um, it's a waste of your hard-earned cash. Um, just a, a quick note. Um, look, if there's anybody out there, and I do see on my attendee list here. Um, a number of uh, existing clients. Um, so thank you very much for joining in. But if I suppose anybody um, who is out there, and if you can really are confused about, geez, I don't know, if my pension is good, bad, or different. I have no idea what my fees are. You know, I wouldn't mind somebody having a look at it. We can certainly do that for you. Have a look, have a look at your fee structure. Give you an idea of the um, the future income and tax-free lump sums, etc., that are likely to come out of the pension, and give you an idea of a couple of changes that. Need, may need to be made if, if appropriate. Um, if that's something you want to avail of, look, just type yes in the question field um, on the software now. Um, and Joanne, she would be sending, Joanne here in our office would be sending your attendance certs um, and notes um, over the next couple of hours. And um, if you want us to look at whatever it is you have, um, you can just let us know then as well. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly simple activity, just a quick chat with you. And um, you know we can contact your pension company and get whatever information is missing and come back to you whenever you're free. So we're just making the offer available out there to anybody who who, who wants to avail of it. Um, that's it. I know I've thrown a lot at you, but we will we will send out the notes and this will be a recording link will uh, be sent to you as well. We will have a webinar number two in October. Um, probably looking at I think uh, based on on requests that we've had over the years is the whole issue of pensions. How are they treated for inheritance tax, retirement funds? How are they treated for inheritance tax? So that it's more of a kind of a technical issue. Um, we just thought we would lead with the the, the the kind of issue of understanding pensions first, just because of the time of year that's actually in it. Um, um, uh, but webinar number two, we, we'll send you a link for that in the next couple of uh, next couple of weeks, um, and your CPD certs will be sent by Joanne as well. I'm just looking. I might have whoa, I time for one question here. Um, um, the few here. So, um, so somebody here is kind of looking at retiring next year, um, and wondering, notwithstanding everything I've said, should they put their pension fund into cash in advance of them retiring, um, just as a precaution? Um, this is not direct advice, so don't take it as such. My my thoughts on that would be, um, maybe put. If you think of what happens when you hit, when you're going to access your pension, you're going to get a quarter of it as a lump sum. That's the bit that's going to that's going to um, come out next year. So certainly, maybe putting a quarter of your pension value into a cash fund in your pension just for the sake of the year that's in it. So at least then you have you've kind of banked the lump sum that's coming out of the pension fund. But the other three quarters of the pension fund, if you kind of go back to our example of what happens when you access a pension fund. The other three quarters of the pension fund, it's not like you're going to be drawing it all down next year as well. The other three quarters of the pension fund you're going to have for 20, 30, 40 years maybe. Um, so there's no, so the principle of long-term investing applies to the other three quarters of the pension fund. So maybe kind of a hybrid approach of, of parking the tax-free cash portion of thereabouts 
in a cash fund just to protect it because that's the bit that's coming out but taking a longer term view with the other three quarters of it because that's going to end up in your approved retirement fund with a different set of investment uh, uh, decisions and so on so um just needs to be planned out a little bit carefully but I, I don't think it's a kind of a nuclear approach of oh god i'm retiring next year i'm going to put it all into cash i think that's a bit um it's a bit too simplistic because you're going to take even if you had it in cash for a year you're going to take a quarter of it out as a lump sum the other three quarters is not going to stay in cash anyhow for the next 20 30 40 years so there kind of doesn't really stack up um, even though what you kind of understand what actually happens when you access the pension fund at retirement. That is me gone over time. Uh, thank you very much. Um, questions, queries, comments, please feel to uh, feel free to email Joanne. Um, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon. And for my existing clients, uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, and I will uh, I know I'll be talking to most of you over the next number of months. Um, um, and uh, thank you much for tuning in and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you so much.